Hello, hello out there on the interweb. We are back in the bat cave. I still don't have my mask on and I need to look somewhere in Mauritius where I can get it. Um, I'm still on the on this fantastic outlook with the conversation with Winston yeah. that there is a chance that we might get an Azure stack appliance uh, on the island of Mauritius in the near future, depending on the demand from local companies. That would be absolutely fantastic. And um, yeah, speaking about cloud and Mauritius, let's welcome our next guest which are namely Kartik Sandlesh uh, as well, mm. Jeanette Fevier. Both of them are from one of our sponsors and supporters, Synthesis. Welcome. How are you doing? Good. Good. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Great, great, great. So tell us, how, how do you see the current situation? Or tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, maybe ladies first, uh, Jeanette, start. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Jeanette. Uh, I'm a senior software developer at Synthesis. I work mainly in the digital channels um, part of the company. Uh, I'm a full stack developer, so I like breaking stuff from the database all the way through to the front end. And that's me. Yeah, fantastic. So, yeah. so I'm Karthik. I'm a customer success manager and a software engineer at Synthesis as well. I also work with Jeanette um, in the digital and emerging market uh, department. Um, and yeah, over the past three years, we've been working with uh, Mauritian clients to deliver cloud based solutions. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, talking about cloud related aspects in Mauritius, what are the primary pain points. Are you going to cover this in your talk? Am I taking something too 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 early here or are we, are we you know, spoiling uh, the, the dish that you're serving us? <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, we see Mauritius as a place where um, they are, you know, businesses that are ready to adopt the cloud mm. and, you know, run their sort of um, operations on it uh, and their ship. Um, and I think what we're looking at is from a primary perspective of like fintech models, so mm. fintech solutions. Um, you know, uh, like you mentioned in the previous talk, uh, you know, with the help of customer, um, you know, requests they could have an Azure bar, uh, mm -hmm. you know, stack over there. Uh, we'd also like uh, the customers to also push regulators to yeah. ensure that uh, you know Mauritius does not stay behind in terms of technology and is able to adopt the cloud. Okay, great. So, uh, Ado, please um, jump in into your talk. Let us know what what is it, what it takes to get Mauritius to the cloud, please. Sure. Uh, intro about Synthesis. Um, Synthesis has been around for about twenty years, um, and it's a uh, you know local South African success story. Uh, we primarily work with uh, you know delivering fintech solutions uh, for blue chip clients, uh, the large banks in South Africa, insurance providers, and wealth managers. Um, we, you know, we're a bunch of builders and thinkers at the office, um, right from, I think, I guess it was very interesting that uh, one of our marketing ladies is like, you know, we've been studying about the cloud and I know what an EC2 is. I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. We so, were so proud. <laughs> yeah, super proud. Um, we love it that um, everybody sort of adopts and, and you know, wants to play with tech. Mm -hmm. um, over the like past five, six years ago, we started to delve into um, AWS and, and you know, getting our hands ready with the cloud. And you know, over that time, we've been involved in, in you know, helping big banks migrate onto the cloud through lift and shift models, migration, cloud enablement, um, as well as developing some cloud first solutions as well. Um, we love to be innovative and picking up new technologies. We're, we're really working um, and, you know, Delivering some solutions using Kafka and then you know exploring that event driven side of the uh, world, mm -hmm. as well as uh, our intelligent data division that's um, you know trying to do some cool stuff with, uh, with artificial intelligence in this um, fintech space. Um, cool. So let's talk about like why Mauritius, right? So you know <laughs> from all of the other talks that I've heard, uh, you know from Regia to to um, Liquid Talk uh, in this whole 
conference, it's very positive to hear that a lot of the companies are looking at Mauritius. Um, and now primarily they all mention that, oh, no, we run like operations there, but not a lot of the, the IT stuff doesn't happen there, right? Like their IT ops doesn't um, run from there a lot. But um, there was a study done with Talon um, and in 2018, um, you know, and this is relevant because we started with our products in, or our delivery in like 2017. So this is pretty um, relevant to us that Mauritius was ranked second in Africa after South Africa as you know, cloud ready and you know, being there to adopt the cloud and be you know, uh, ready to, to utilize its full power. Um, and it's very nice to, to see that Mauritius is second compared to like, you know, traditionally in Africa, we look at like, oh, we look at South Africa, we look at Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana. It's like sort of those um, vibrant economies that, um, that promote uh, using new technologies. And, and it's good to see Mauritius there because of the amazing laws that you guys have. A lot of big companies love to have their operational head there. Um, and, you know, you know, with a beautiful island that you guys have and Phoenix, we all love Phoenix. <laughs> um, Maybe you know, too much. A lot. <laughs> um, you know, we get to, you know, present a nice lifestyle as well for developers to be there and, and you know, grow that economy. Um, so let's look at what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, so as you know, the world is moving fast and, and software needs to keep up. Uh, how we approach uh, software development today uh, is we start by building something small, something we can experiment with, um, and then we need to get feedback on this because we need to know if we are on the right track. Uh, with that feedback, we then go, we brainstorm a little bit, we gather some ideas, and then take that again and do some more experiments. And so we continue this loop. So in order to help us to be uh, innovative, we need a little sandbox environment. We need to be able to create sandbox environments for these experiments. And we need these environments uh, to be able to grow as our experiments grow. So when we talk about on-prem, we talk about procuring infrastructure, which can become a little bit tricky. Um, how much is enough you know, to start with? Uh, can we easily add? Uh, as we grow and then sometimes you know time uh, it can take time to actually go and buy everything and set it up and this is where cloud comes into our discussion uh, and why we love to leverage it uh, the cloud is elastic uh, it gives us this ability to start small to add to it uh, and to scale it up and down uh, as our uh, usage uh, needs tend to change Cool. So let's just talk about what we're going to you know, get through with this talk. Um, Jeanette and I, like I said, uh, we've been working with Cloudflare Solutions um, the past three years in Mauritius, and we're going to talk about how we deliver containerized microservices on AWS. Uh, we're going to talk about how we were storing and managing our data um, on cloud, um, looking at delivering on front end, um, some of the CI CD stuff that we did, um, a bit about the compliance, and then, you know, what are the little um, checklist items that we can quickly get rid of, um, you know, on the cloud that usually takes a little bit more time, um, you know, when we're developing an on-prem solution. And, and some general housekeeping that we learned, um, you know, as the years were, you know, progressed and, uh, and we had to, to maintain our system as well. So let's look at the landscape of containerization on AWS. Um, so there are four major services um, available. And it started off with uh, ECS, uh, Elastic Container Service. You'll notice that like, there's an E or an S in front of most of these um, AWS services. They're either Elastic or they're simple, which is brilliant. Um, and you know, Elastic Container Service is what we use um, for our delivery of uh, our microservices. You know, with the growing popularity with Kubernetes, um, AWS has also launched a fully managed um, sort of solution for, to help you deploy your um, Kubernetes solutions. Um, with EKS, uh, which is something that we use from now on, uh, we find it to be very powerful, and uh, EKS a really enjoy in, in taking away a lot of the, um, the sort of nitty-gritty first principle stuff that you need to do with Kubernetes. Uh, Fargate came a bit after ECS, where um, it was a serverless way of, um, of, of you know, delivering your containerized um, services. And ECR is the container registry um, that we use for our images and storing. 
So looking at Amazon ECS, we're going to talk about deployment. Uh, by deployment, I don't mean the microservices. I mean the creating of the infrastructure, the resources on AWS, um, you know, what we used, um, and how can you get it set up. Uh, talk about availability, uh, creating that available solution, um, some cost optimization because it can get out of hand if you don't keep an eye on it. Scaling because we did run it on production and we did have these sort of issues uh, and, and how we manage that. Um, some security aspects and monitoring and logging. So let's just look at the fundamental building blocks of um, ECS. So um, you speak about containers, you need a place to store those images um, so that you can pull them and run them. Uh, you need some container instances, which are basically the sort of machines that you're going to run your um, your, your uh, containers on. Um, so these would be EC2 instances. Um, and task and service definitions that you would use to help orchestrate and then, you know, help with the scaling, the availability, some security, logging, all of that stuff. So we in containers, right? Um, we use Docker, as, as most people do. Um, and and this is pretty cool for us because, like, you know, on local host, we could typically, you know, typically use like Docker Compose and stuff, and we were able to build it. But we also like this. This um, we also want to containerize it because I'm tired of Jeanette making something and, and then saying it works on my machine. You sort out yourself, like you Windows user. You you know you don't know things. I can't help it. Always works on my machine. Come on. <laughs> so it works. Uh, you know it's a nice way to standardize it. Um, you know we get to uh, you know get the runtime standardized libraries, tools, and codes. Uh, what's nice with ECR when it comes to that is it just uses standard Docker APIs. So if you're used to doing Docker login, push, pull, all of that stuff, um, you know, you, you'd find it similar and familiar uh, with, with ECR. Mm -hmm. um, and it integrates very easily with ECS. Um, what's also nice is I think, um, I think there was a survey done by Datacom, um, and ECR was the first private, almost popular private repo, a container registry, and then like so right after Docker in terms of its like you know, grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's a it's a very new thing that you can learn and you can kind of follow the same concept, but just lives in that um, AWS ecosystem. Um, just got some. Uh, you just go back to the previous. Sorry. No problem. Um, just got some scripts here, right? So you know, speaking of standardization, um, it's really good to have your infrastructure, um, you know, using some infrastructure as code. So I just put in two examples just to show how similar it means. Uh, so we use Terraform um, for our um, deployment um, of, of AWS structure. Uh, we found it uh, pretty deaf friendly, uh, find it easy to read. Um, if you're starting out, please use the console because it kind of walks you through the, the sort of stuff. But uh, you know, as you go into a bit more mature level, you want to move into something like um, Terraform or Cloud Formation. You can see that it reads very similar. Um, there's not a lot of um, like nuances that, that you know happen in a different manner. That you you know, if you know Cloud Formation, you may not be able to go back to Terraform. It's, it's still transferable. So you know, pick your poison. So now I'll just look at um, how we could. Um, how these things sort of, you know, pieces fit together, these building blocks. So you'll see that on the left, you have your ECR, your, your container registry. Um, you know, it talks to your ECS. Your ECS is able to talk, speak to it. And then you have your service and task definitions. And at the bottom, you have those, like on the right hand side, you have those container instances, those EC2 instances. Uh, what ECS does is just like runs a little container on those instances. Um, container instances, um, it's an ECS agent. And that guy is responsible for orchestrating your definitions that you would give it, right? So, if you want a free transaction service, you could specify the bit of you know um, the strategy that you wanted. Um, so you want two on one box, one on the other, or you want three of them running. So the, the sort of agent knows how to make it run. Um, there are different strategies, and we'll discuss that in the slides coming forward. So. Let's look at container instances. So you're responsible for a lot of things here, right? Like you're responsible for creating that cluster, making sure that you've got those um, instances, um, you know, task definitions, et cetera, et cetera. But when you come to container instances, there are building blocks that are available from AWS that you can use um, to achieve this. So if we look at deployment, um, like I mentioned for the container registry, you could use Terraform um, to, to start up your cluster. Um, if you're Brave and you want to try that, like maybe use a CLI and have a little batch scripts. I don't know how for the cowboys out there. Yeah, I don't know how you, how 
I don't know. If, I don't know if I'll be able to follow, but uh, definitely, um, you know, do it if you want to. Uh, you could use CloudFormation as well. Um, so you know, we, we recommend picking that because standardizing that helped us a lot in our case. Um, there would be cases where Dev UAT would go down. You know, we'd be very comfortable of just saying, "Cool, let's let's just run this thing again," um, and it works for us. Um, Looking at security, um, you could, uh, you know, so they give you, so AWS gives you this uh, sort of RBAC um, attribute based um, sort of, uh, roles that you could add onto your containers. But you got to be careful here because um, what we notice is like you don't want to give your container um, the sort of roles for the services that you're going to use in AWS, uh, but you probably might want to ship that to the task level rather than the container level because then all services, all containers running on that um, instance will have. Uh, rights there. Um, you could also utilize Inspector for auditing um, and then UPC flow logs as well, just to give you that bit of comfort of, of you know, what's moving in and out and how you could um, keep track of that. Um, patching is a thing that um, I wasn't aware of and then it came to bite us very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you know, there were exploits in the, on some of the instances and we had to learn how to manage that. So I think this is definitely something that you should try and do, like you know, run a cloud formation script or a Terraform script to make sure that you have patching in place, um, you know, making sure that your AMIs are updated. You, you, I would, I mean, look, for me, I didn't have to do a lot of uh, making our own AMIs because the organization we worked with didn't have their own sort of set of rules. Um, so it was easy for us to just kind of use that building block and then just update it to the new ones and carry on. Um, and, and that helped, but in certain cases, you know, big banks and, or different policies of an organization may allow you, to, may, may want you to have like, you know, your sort of specific AMIs. And in that case, you know, you would need to have like sort of a, uh, a timely approach to make sure that, um, you know, you're, you're updating those, those instances correctly all the time. Um, monitoring, so CloudWatch worked very well for us. Um, we were able to standardize our, you know, stuff that's happening on the containers and the containers to CloudWatch, um, and then you know, use insights to just you know, filter it through. It worked well for us, but you know, with AWS, there's like a lot of things that come through as well. I think there's for ECS, there's like a little Prometheus plugin that you can get from um, there's a GitHub, GitHub repo. If somebody wants it, you can ask me. I'll send you a link for it. Um, so you can have a little combined place for all your metrics and and. Um, you know, and you know, give that additional bit of monitoring. Um, scaling and availability is always something that gets asked, you know, when you move to the cloud because that's something that you always sell, right? Like we're like highly elastic, <laughs> and so let's do that through through auto scaling groups. Uh, they worked well for us. Um, like in my instance, it was like the organization that I had to develop the solution for. They uh, they expect a lot of traffic quarterly. Um, so we knew that every quarter we could increase it and, and you know give them a better instance. And during the day, because their internal stock was quite low, we could have it a little. But in Jeanette's case, it was like um, you know holiday seasons, so yes. so we managed it along that side. Um, and just a lot of daily activity, but in the nights it's very quiet, so we scale down at night to save yeah. some costs. Yeah, and I think it like adding to that, like it, it runs very perfectly with your sort of cost control. So like for Dev and UAT, we used to just shut them off because mm. um, we're not zombies and we don't want to work at 4 a.m. in the morning. Like not this. always. Yeah, not always. <laughs> only when we deploy on a Friday and everything breaks. Yes, of course. Um, so that's the only time that you <laughs> probably want everything running. And then, you know, with cost control, it's really nice uh, that you, need, you could, um, as, so we did like for our product environment, uh, you know, when you get a bit stable, you probably want to investigate and, and uh, invest in reserved instances. Um, in certain cases for organizations, it helps you save quite a lot, a significant amount. And spot instances are good for like if you had some batch stuff running or if you want to just test something out on, um, on you know, as a batch of thing that was working and you didn't really care if it wasn't available all the time. So, um, you know. Like Dev, we run some of our instances as spot instances yeah. in Dev because if they go down, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, mm -hmm. you fix the price and you carry on. Yeah. yeah. So let's look at task definitions. Um, these are things that you would be typically um, configuring a lot. Um, so you've got your, your, you know, your name of the service, the, the task that you're going to give it. Um, you give it a nice little image link, um, so you can see we've we've been presenting our. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the real account number, but you know, <laughs> to that particular thing, the CPU and the memory utilization. Uh, an essential tag. The essential tag just helps you say that, like, you know, if a container is running, this thing, I mean, like, this task is valid if a container is running. So, um, 
you know, task goes, I mean, container goes down, task goes down. You can put in some metrics to understand, oh, my container is not running, you know, um, put, put in some availability, um, you know, uh, contingency plans over there. Yeah. Some port mapping, um, if you're using Docker, you're pretty used to port mapping. Um, environment variables can be passed in here. Uh, what's really cool is to add some, you know, granularity with your security, so with your IAM roles here. So the user service probably might want to speak to your authentication service or, or you know, some email service or Cognito or SES and, mm -hmm. um, and stuff like that. And you can add that specific role to this particular task, and that should help you go forward. Um, what's nice is like task, word, uh, task definitions of version. So you get a nice way from your image, um, a sort of point in time of your code, and through um, you know your your sort of task definition of point in time of how you deploy it on on, um, on the cloud. So and all of this JSON objects is passed through your Docker daemon, um, and and that particular ECS agent knows how to set it up and you know, run the container. So. Task definitions can run on its own, but you're typically not just going to have something that just runs once and you know can die. Um, you probably want long-running services and available. So services helps you orchestrate that for you, right? So if, uh, you create a service and you know you you start putting in things that you want, right? So you give it a task definition that you want um, that service to run. Um, you can see on line five, you can set a desired count. You can give it some IAM roles. Um, you can give it some placement strategy, which is really cool uh, because that helps you work with your availability and scalability aspect. So for us, I mean, I, I remember starting off our product, but it was probably not a great idea. So we started off with just like one instance of like, you know, a container running and then it died. And then my clients phoned me and said, you built something really horrible. Um, and then you have to fix that, uh, which, so then we learned about placement strategies and, you know, Having them spread across uh, multiple availability zones or instances. In this case, I'm saying, you know, I want two of these guys available and I want them on different boxes. So I think that one box is a problem, I have another sort of available. Um, you can be very clever with it, like use your CloudWatch metrics to make sure that you know you're doing it on memory basis or something like that. Um, a lot of the times, like I said, uh, my you know, with, with the services that I was working with, a lot of quarterly stuff. So um, during the end of the quarter, you probably want to um, you know, increase the number of services available and memory or something like that because mm -hmm. most of your services will be transient and they probably wouldn't use a lot of system data, but some of them, like the service that I had was like generating PDFs, right? And it would save some and, you know, that would probably cause a lot of um, problems on there where memory might run out. So, you know, we'd make contingency plan there, which is quite nice to have because now you've just got into a nice cable to do that. And it attaches very easily with the load balancer, so your outside traffic coming in gets routed in very comfortably, and you know you can have that going on for your APIs. Right. So let's chat databases. Uh, we obviously need a place to store our data uh, in the cloud. There are quite a few solutions you can look at for for databases. Uh, we want to chat about Amazon Aurora because that's what we've been using for the last three years. So Aurora is a cloud native implementation of a relational database management system. Uh, it was created by AWS. Um, so it's compatible with MySQL and Postgres. Uh, what this means um, or what makes it quite nice is if you already have a database, um, you can easily migrate this database to Aurora and usually you don't need to fiddle with your code too much, in some cases not at all, to, to get it working. So uh, when we create an Aurora database, uh, we specify what engine we want, that's your MySQL or Postgres with the version that you want to run. We say how many instances we want. Uh, and then uh, which availability zones uh, they should span. What AWS will then do is it will go and provision the hardware for us, set up the databases, uh, and then one of your instances will become your primary instance or your, your writer database, and the rest become read replicas. Um, it also, AWS will also then create this little um, cluster volume that spans across all your um, 
availability zones that you've selected uh, and there it keeps uh, data copies which uh, is for fault tolerance for uh, high availability um, so uh, there are quite a few different configurations you can set up it's, it's very granular uh, I just want to speak about um, backups of course uh, it has uh, bitten us in the past it's, it's fairly important to to automate your backups. Um, what's nice is you can set up a window, the, the preferred time of the day when you want your backups to run. In this example, we have seven to nine. We would normally uh, have it in the middle of the night, but it kind of depends on your client so when their, uh, you know, their quiet periods are. And then you can specify how long you want to retain these backups. In this example, we have five days. Uh, it depends. Look, if you're on a dev environment, you might not even, you know, do backups or, or you want to test that out, so you might keep your backups for a day. Uh, we're on a prod environment. Uh, it's usually tied to your compliance requirements, like, like what's the company's standards on keeping backups. So the nice thing of Aurora, uh, it's fault tolerant, which is great, right? So if you look at our little image here, if you have a primary instance running in availability zone A and something happens to that zone, it goes down, there's an issue, um, Aurora will automatically switch over that secondary in, um, instance. It will promote it to primary and route all the traffic to that instance. And as soon as availability zone A is up or available again, it will spin up your secondary instance in that zone so that you once again have this um, set up so that you're, you're okay for any failures. And obviously the best part, your users have no idea. So for us, um, we normally span it across three availability zones and I think AWS also recommends that uh, just so that should there be a scenario where two zones go down, you're still covered. AWS also provides you the ability to span your replicas across regions, should you choose to, um, and that leads into DR, right? Now you've got kind of a DR setup going because you've got your databases already running in a completely different region. Right, so a few other um, aspects, uh, scalability, you can scale vertically. This is your compute power, your memory usage, and we basically do this by increasing the size, uh, the instance size um, of our Aurora um, cluster. Horizontally, we scale by adding more replicas, more read replicas to, to increase our read throughput. Uh, something we obviously learned is uh, it helps to um, update your application as well so that it knows how uh, when it's reading it needs to read from the read replica and only when it's writing actually write to your primary instance. Uh, just a little note there. Security wise, um, you have to put your database in a VPC. You can't actually set it up without selecting a virtual private cloud. So this isolates your, your database from the, the greater network. Uh, and then we obviously put our data databases in a private subnet. We add security groups as well, just to, to control that access, you know, which applications can talk to it, which resources. Um, and then, um, as one of my colleagues helped me out, um, adding a network access control list is also a good idea, commonly referred to as a, an ACL. Um, and that's basically adding a security group to your entire subnet. So, um, also like protecting it at like one extra level. And then finally, serverless. So, you can run your Aurora. Or a, a cluster as, as a serverless uh, database, which basically means AWS manages the vertical and horizontal scaling. You don't have to uh, specify how many instances you want. Um, it will do all that for you. It's also a pay per use, which means you only pay for uh, the resources that you consume. So when you do a read, when you do a write. Uh, however, this is um, 
really only for unpredictable or intermittent workloads. It doesn't it's not a fit all purpose. You kind of need to see and do that cost analysis to understand uh, when this is a applicable to you, sorry. Cool, so like, you know, we've got our um, sort of services running and got the database to store that stuff. So I'm a little front end. Um, generally, like, you know, we all work with um, Angular, Vue, or React. Mm -hmm. um, and, and S3 gives us a nice little way of, you know, hosting those little single page applications um, on, on S3. So, you know, you use your little, you know, bundler, you webpack, whatever, uh, and, you know, you just, push up that disk folder up onto S3 and you can um, you know serve up your, your you know UI through there. Um, and and if you just look at it, um, you know, just don't forget to, to you know block the public access. Um, like I don't know if you guys heard our other guys we have a talk, um, Evan and LP around the Unomia. Uh, that product will send you a nice little love letter email to say that you know you, you've got a whole bucket that needs to be secured. Not the love letter I want, but yeah. yes. <laughs> Um, and then, like you know, just with SBAs, you know, they generally have a, a way of you know figuring out uh, what their routes that they have. So you know, the error page just sets it back to the index HTML and kind of just like helps you uh, run your application very easily. So if you look at the little architecture at the bottom, you know, if you just Google like you know, static web hosting with S3, you'll find this thing, and it's pretty cool that you know you can like, host your S3, uh, you know, your, your sort of web app on the S3 bucket. Uh, you could deliver it through uh, CloudFront and, uh, you know, have a nice little DNS resolver in the front with Route 53 to give it a friendly little name, uh, you know, a link. And then, you know, you can have it nicely, easily uh, given it to your um, customers. So if we look at delivering it to the world in terms of like, how do we have it just, you know, uh, sent out um, to the whole world, we used uh, CloudFront. Uh, the nice part is CloudFront easily integrates with, uh, with S3. It's a great little CDN for us. It's just available in, um, in AWS. Uh, out of the box, you get a lot of things like you know you get your HTTPS set. So all the security guys just keep on you know hopping on you. That and even if you're in like text, like, oh I was in there HTTPS. So, like, at least we'll, so we'll give you one, and you can carry on um, and you know uh, focus on on building things. That's what you want to be focused on. Um, has cool caching as well um, and versioning. Um, we created a way for us to make sure that uh, once we're bumping up versions, um, you know, we we just invalidate the cache on, on um, CloudFront and the user doesn't experience anything against the latest one. Um, so there's a thing that you might want to be aware of because it, I think it does it on a 24 hour roll period um, where it kind of updates the edge locations, but if you want to, you know, set up a hot fix, which I generally do a lot because, you know, who doesn't have bugs? Um, you're gonna have bugs that. are free. Yeah, bugs are free. Um, and then you want some performance, right? So um, a lot of the guys when they're building things, you know, you may not focus a lot on, you know, making that, um, that app to the tiniest size. So you click a little checkbox on, on, on CloudFront and you G's a bit and you, you push it up. So, Helps you out a lot, like you do a lot of those training wheels up front, and then you just put in a little, you know, 53 DNS in front of it, gives it um, you know, a nice touch uh, for your users to to not access some random weird at CloudFront, um, and then we use Bath a little bit. I mean, I didn't have to go into a lot of rooms, but um, I think Janet had uh, with her plan had to put in a bit more room set. But with Bath, you get those, you know, top 10 or uh, settings done in the beginning. Uh, you know, we set it up with like some geolocation IP sets as well to make sure that our dev and test environments are not like all that publicly available. So you can add all of that um, level of, of um, granularity if you want with these tools at hand. Right. So authentication. We we need to have a way to to manage all the users that's hopefully going to make use of our new website. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> gone are the days when we have to actually write our own uh, authentication service. You know, hashing and salting and all of that niceties. So thank goodness that's done. We can now make use of these authentication as a service uh, providers. We've um, been using Cognito uh, for a while. So um, many, let, let's uh, look at it from, from that point of view. 
Uh, so Cognito uh, it easily integrates into our front end and into our microservices. Uh, we use the, the SDK. And then it gives us this ability to manage usernames and passwords, uh, provide single sign-on, um, multi-factor authentication, which is a must uh, nowadays, um, device management. You know, everyone has at least uh, two, maybe three devices, and with all the new fancy stuff coming out, that will just increase. And we need to be able to, to add some security uh, layer to that, those devices. Um, and then password policies, right? So um, usually the company has a, a preset uh, a rule set of, of what the password should look like. So it's pretty nice that uh, you can manage that through your authentication service. Uh, and then uh, tracking activity, right? You need to know um, who's logging in, um, how often, you know, how often are they changing their password, uh, requesting a, a, a reset of their password. Um, this can help for, you know, detecting suspicious uh, behavior or, or maybe there's just something that's confusing to the user uh, with the login process and, and we need to improve on that. Great. Um, so, <laughs> we live in a world where, where companies are shipping software like every minute. Uh, and, and that basically means that you need to automate. The manual processes are, are just too slow. And that brings us to CI/CD. Um, so what's important for us when it comes to CI/CD? Um, we strive to be agile. We, we want this fast feedback loop. And, and in order to do that, we need to be able to ship our code uh, at a faster pace uh, in order to get that feedback. Um, and CI/CD gives us this tool set which we can use uh, to deliver faster and to make it more reliable because we are reducing a uh, human error by automating most of it. Um, and then just to talk about what we wanted, when, when we designed our CI/CD pipeline, um, these are the things that, that we thought uh, is very important. We wanted the ability to build once. Uh, we don't want to build uh, the code set for each environment. We want to build it once, create an artifact so that we can test that artifact uh, and then only deploy the artifacts to the different environments. We also tag these artifacts so that we can keep track of you know, when they were built, by who, and uh, for which environment are we using them. A little diagram of our current um, way of building our pipeline. So we use Bitbucket Pipeline. Um, there are so many different tools out there uh, that you can use. Uh, AWS has its own code pipeline suite. Uh, with the version control and it ties quite nicely into your different services. But we were quite comfortable with Bitbucket Pipeline, so we continued using it. So you'll see we have a dev, he or she will push some code to a feature branch. That code is reviewed by a fellow developer or a team member. Um, once accepted, that gets merged into master, where we then run our automated tests. Only if they pass do we then build our uh, Docker container, our Docker image, sorry, or for our front end, we, we just build up our distribution. We then push that Docker image to ECR for our microservices and tag it with a commit hash so that we can keep track of those images. Then when we come to deployment, we will simply tag our image in ECR with um, the environment we want it to be deployed to, and then it gets automatically deployed to, in this case, it would be ECS. When we look at other environments like QA, prod, maybe pre-prod, um, there's no build step, as you can see. It's mainly we tag our commit, um, we have a watch on that. The, the pipeline will, will go into ECR, tag the image with the, let's say, QA tag, and then it will uh, deploy uh, it to ECS. So just a few scripts of, of like our pipelines. 
the first one there is just a little uh, clip to show you how we run our unit test. So we use a Docker container and then run the test within that container so that we can test first before we build and deploy. And the second one, just to show how we build our S, uh, oh, sorry, our web application, uh, which we then save in an S3 bucket, and, and that bucket contains all our artifacts uh, for our web application. And number three there is just to show how we make use of, um, so it's uh, the AWS CLI, that uh, bit bucket gives us this little pipe which helps us to then build our image and then we use the pipe to actually push it to ECR makes it much simpler um, than actually writing bash scripts to do that. And all of this, um, it's, it's, it makes life easier. You now uh, don't have to remember the steps that you followed. It's all documented as well. Right, so now compliance. Um, it's important that we know what's going on in our systems. We need to be able to track activity. And when we talk about activity, um, it's important to, to understand, uh, you know, how do we reproduce any steps? How do we, you know, check for suspicious activity within our system? Um, CloudTrail is uh, one of the tools we use in AWS to track uh, activity within our AWS account, creating of instances and so forth. And then we use CloudWatch, as Kotick mentioned earlier, to manage uh, our application logs. Uh, this helps us, you know, when we want to search through those logs, uh, when we want to identify some activity, and it even helps us to expedite responses to auditor requests. Right next, infrastructure as code. Um, so in terms of compliance, infrastructure as, as code is important because uh, it gives us accountability. Uh, it's now uh, just a code set that we can uh, put in source control, which gives us the benefits of source control, which is single source of truth, we can facilitate some collaboration between uh, the different devs and to accelerate this release process. It also makes it easier to roll back in scenarios where there's a, a problem because it's code. And we know that the same source code generates the same binaries for applications. It's the same with the infrastructure as code model. Uh, it will always generate the same environment. And finally, uh, we make it testable. We can now test our infrastructure because it's code. We can write test cases uh, against it and then prevent common deployment issues. Fault tolerance and high availability. Uh, when we look at on-prem, there's usually a, a, quite a significant upfront financial investment that, that you need to forego because you need to cater for the peak periods, right? You can't just uh, get infrastructure for that middle of the night run. Um, where with the cloud, it's, it gives you scalability, right? You can scale up and down as you need. Um, on-prem, you need expertise, uh, like certain resources, your infrastructure guys, your network um, guy. And uh, on the cloud, we get services, and AWS manages a lot of the underlying tech for us. Uh, it makes it slightly easier. Uh, and then finally, a failure. On-prem, on you only know about a failure uh, after the fact, and then some human needs to intervene to, to get it working again. We're on the cloud. Um, a lot of the failures can be detected automatically, and then it's got this auto-healing aspect where it can bring up certain resources if they've gone down. Backup and DR. Um, so with the ability to have you have multiple regions, you can back up in, in different regions. 
And uh, this helps with DR because now uh, you can have different levels of backup and recovery. You can store your backups in different regions. And with Terraform, you can easily spin up a whole new environment uh, in a different region. The other option is you can simply run your whole system in a different region, in two or three regions, where if one goes down, uh, you have another one already running. You just divert traffic. And uh, just to note on that case, is you're going to have a little bit higher cost related because you're obviously duplicating or tripling your, um, your resource usage. Right, so that's a lot from our side. And what's really cool is that, um, you know, after all of the stuff is done, uh, we have some like learnings that we had. Um, so just some general housekeeping that you like should be aware of is, you know, patching, uh, mm -hmm. patching and upgrading those EC2 instances. Um, like I mentioned previously, like, you know, it was a thing that we learned. So just make sure that's there. Use toolings for your cost optimization. So AWS budgets is really good to mm -hmm. get some forecasted, you know, understanding of that. Uh, log rotation might not be just for like your CloudWatch logs, but um, you know when you're running with ECS, you get some Docker logs that get logged onto the machine. So uh, happens a couple of times where like you know on a product environment, it's like oh the can't spin up another container because I don't have space. Um, so you know you might want to create some cloud formation script or a Terraform script to help you with that. Um, you know keeping your cloud trail log, your CloudWatch metrics, you know driven like the like like well, policy for it. Um, backups like Janet's already mentioned around data and you know all your logs and stuff and Making sure that you've got some auto healing processes put in with your um, auto scaling groups and your you know DB, that your availability um, you know options available, and that's us guys. So just a note at the end, um, yeah. If you like what we do and the tech we work with, um, you know visit our website. And yeah, if you're interested in working with us, uh, send us your CV if you want to. All right, fantastic. Yeah. Jeanette, Katik, thank you so much for these explanations and also the type of work that you're doing in Mauritius. Um, also, um, a big thank you that Synthesis is uh, acting and uh, supporting the community in, in uh, all kinds of aspects. Um, we are really happy to have you on board. Um, in regards to the different uh, aspects that you, that you uh, spoke about, I mean, do you see that it is kind of um specific to amazon aws or would you say okay this is something that easily replicates on on other platforms like uh, microsoft azure or google cloud platform so the interesting part about this is that's why i like mentioned like now we do stuff with kubernetes rather than um, using ecs is mm -hmm. that um you know, with, with these regulations going on, and especially the clients who work within the banking industry and you know insurance industry, mm -hmm. um, the regulations usually require you to be as cloud native as possible. So, although we are a partner with AWS in South Africa, um, and you know mm -hmm. in Africa as well, I mean, uh, it is possible to replicate it. I mean, we all know that all of the sort of you know popular uh, cloud providers like GCP, Azure, and AWS, they all kind of converge onto the same thing because they're competing with each other, like you know, they've yeah. got some cultural competition. So you know, if if, if Amazon launches uh, something for Kubernetes, uh, you're yeah, well true. ensure that you know that you know Azure and you know is doing the same. And obviously, Google already had that available, right? So. Um, it's, it doesn't take long for them to also provide you this availability to have it across all three providers. Okay, that's great. That's great. Adia, something on your side? Well, for me, uh, I wish that uh, AWS has more presence here in Mauritius uh, and even CloudFront mm -hmm. with the cache here, uh, CDN, mm -hmm. and all of that. Uh, it's just these comments that I would like to make. Else, uh, very interesting part of on uh, CI and CD uh, deployment and the pipeline and all. I, f I found that very interesting and we'll try to apply it to my job. I see the as you can hear, sorry. <laughs> That's great. Um, just to add to that, guys, like with the, with the presence being created, Synthesis is looking to come into Mauritius and, and grow that presence, right? Uh, we are uh, you know, we are very sort of AWS focused, and, and you know, and I agree with you that there should be presence. And 
you know, just like I was, you know, saying that the other companies are looking to, you know, push that drive, they should push that drive to have cloud regulations being available on the island um, mm -hmm. so that it's popular. I think Mauritius has such a cool presence in the sense that, you know, the way it's politically positioned as well as geographically positioned, yeah. um, you know, it allows that ability for people to develop a lot of products in Mauritius and being able to deliver it to Africa. Um, as well as having a close connection with Europe and, and, and China and, and India as well, uh, mm. you know, where a lot of uh, tech is adopted yeah. much quickly. And yeah. so, you know, we have the opportunity to set that pace. And, and I think we've enjoyed that for the past few years as well. Like, I mean. Yeah, and, and to the, the cloud, you know, nativeness, we always go in with the idea to, to help the client be cloud ready. Um, yep. And I mean, that means whichever cloud provider, and, and like Patek mentioned, we we work with AWS quite closely, so obviously we, we talk about them quite often, but uh, the idea is cloud ready means any cloud you can move or, or you move on to, to that cloud provider as easily as possible and as quick as possible, uh, because I think it becomes a race, right? And you are going to fall behind if you can't uh, get to the cloud um, sooner rather than later. Fantastic. I mean, the thing is also mm -hmm. what yeah. uh, with your activities and focus on AWS, I'm pretty sure you will be thrilled to actually know that there is an AWS user group somehow yeah. active, uh, you know, somewhere in the ranks of the MCC. And uh, cool. with your with your increased presence, I think this can easily kick off with with more participation, with more activities. And uh, cool. with that, again, big thank you. Um, we're gonna be back after a short break. And uh, please, everyone out on the internet, stay tuned on the stream. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Jürgen. Have a nice day. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye.